So this will, I'll, so this uh, recording I'll, I'll throw up on uh, a YouTube channel and my podcast so that people can hear it. And with that, I want to say thank you all for coming. Thank you, Neil, for being here. We're so honored that you would be here to talk about this. And uh, for those who don't know, so my um, auntie, she actually married uh, Fred's brother, Leo. So me and Neil are actually cousins, cousins. <laughs> okay, okay. That's how that works, Neil. So I, oh. I'd love for you to just take the floor and, and just start talking about your dad and, and this book in any way you'd like. Yeah, um, I really like, I'm, so I'm kind of used to uh, new to this. So just uh, bear with me. It's uh, It's been a long stretch for us. So uh, um, it's, well, we, we, we try to have a feast for my dad. That's the first thing is uh, November 24th. So uh, things change fast, you know, um, pandemic and uh, not seeing each other. Um, uh, we, I lost a few family members and about four in the, in the last four years, I've lost uh, like way too many people. So feel like uh, when you go through uh, grief, um, man, I, uh, like I, I know how powerful grief is. So I, I've had to learn it uh, the hardest way possible. So I'm uh, trying to, you know, I, I've been struggling. I struggled for about half a year with grief, um, with the Call Me Indian. It's it's so, like the story, the development of the book, the the, the Call Me Indian book, the, the post Call Me Indian, um, the release, it's, it's such a fairy tale for us. So, you know, like I'm trying to figure out where do I start? So my dad is Fred Sasakamus and he, um, he was a man that uh, was angry um, from the years I know him. He was, uh, so I, I only know my father from one side. And uh, you know, when you, uh, I'm born in 1967. So uh, I'm getting up there myself. And, uh, and you know, when you're born in this, I think when you grew up in the seventies and it's hard for people to relate to the 1970s. Um, but in the 1970s for me, I caught the tail end of a uh, lot of angry, angriness or anger on, on the first nation on the reserve. We call it the reserve. I just want to speak candid if I could, it's easier for me. I'm, I'm more of a, uh, a free speaker. I'm not, I don't like, trying to get boxed myself in because then it it prevents me from talking because I'm, I'm being careful and uh so I grew up on a reserve and uh in the reserve I grew up on was had really good times and it had some really bad times and and the bad times for me are uh, alcohol um a lot of family violence a lot of lot of a uh, lot of abuse like in terms of uh uh um you know husbands be um uh, hitting their wives um and you know there's a lot of words for those i'm just going to try to speak as candid as i can and uh i've seen lots of that you know growing up uh, i've seen lots of kids scared like my age and like you know you're talking five to ten year olds there like you see a lot of parties you see a lot of kids scared there's you know you look for safe havens to go to they're they're, they're uh they get made uh, for you. You don't really know it, but you start sorting out really quick where safe places are. And my grandmother, Mike Kokum, uh, Sujil Sasakamus, Roderick Sasakamus, that was one of our, our safe havens. There is a couple of mothers that didn't drink. My mother never drank in her entire life. And, uh, and she's a, a champ. So, you know, I, I, I was, felt safe there. I felt safe, uh, you know, neighbors, certain neighbors you could go to. Um, and then you knew where the, you know, people, there was violence or, or a lot of alcohol. And my dad grew up um, angry. I, I had no idea. Um, I, you just don't know any difference. So if your dad is angry, you don't know any difference. You, you, like it, it's the life you're, you're living inside of. So and you just get you just get used to it like it's uh, you know um and my dad through the years he settled down um 
in the mid in the early 80s, I lost uh, a sister, my oldest sister. Her name was Phyllis, and it was my dad's firstborn, and that would have been his that would have been his uh, baby, you know, baby girl, firstborn girl, you know, um, really athletic, really proud of her, and uh, but uh, stubborn, just like him, uh, hard headed, stubborn, you know, uh, argue, you know, uh, with him. Uh, you know, I remember a lot of arguments and, you know, but I, I remember a lot of good things, but when you're a kid, you, it seems like some of the memories you get are your, are the scared memories you have, like what, what sinks into you deep. And, and it's usually, I, my memories are based on, on kind of fear, being scared, having fear, some kind of, or seeing or witnessing something. And, uh, and, uh, so, you know, we, we shoot forward. Um, people started getting to, uh, to my father. He, he, when he slowed down, he became an elder. Um, and then he slowly, slowly started evolving. Uh, just like this, uh, I don't know, kind of like a flower, I would say. You know, you, you know like a slow growing, blooming, late blooming flower. Um, he he, he uh, slowly grew out of who he was. And he became this something else. But, you know, when you're, you're a person, you can't forgive anyone. And it's really hard to forgive a parent. Like, it's one of the most painful experiences, if, if people will understand. Um, it's really difficult to forgive a parent because you're always a kid, I find. You're always a child when you're, you're even if you're 50 or 60, um, you're still like a child to them. And, and you still have... Uh, love but you still you still have some hurt if you're if you're bearing anger or hurt it'll come out and my dad was uh, was he was getting entertained for about a decade to do a book and I didn't know anything about it um, and uh, people were going to him he would call me at uh, you know years towards the end of his life in the last 10 years of his life, he would phone me. I would go meet these people. My dad would leave them. And he'd say, uh, Neil, uh, you know, um, Neil, uh, just sit here. I'll be right back. And, and I, you know, the first time he did it, I was sitting there. And he said, I'm just going to the truck. I'll be right back. And then I, the, the, the person flew from somewhere. I think it was Los Angeles that time. And uh, they wanted to... Uh, grab his story and they had a, a contract for him to sign and my dad was uh being unrealistic he was he, I, you know i could tell he was being fidgety uh he was avoiding um he was asking for money and he, he's not built like that but he was trying to make excuses to get mad and and uh, and and anything this guy would say it would trip him like he, he would go from zero to 60 and uh and uh, so I ended up, you know, that was my first encounter with with people like that. And, um, and they were all good people, they just didn't know how to approach him. So he, he you know, I ended up sitting with that guy for about two hours at a coffee shop, and uh, we waited and waited. And, you know, he got really angry. And where's your dad? And I phoned him. He said, I'm at uh, there's the bridge. It's about an hour and, you know, about 45 minutes to an hour north of Saskatoon. And I phoned him on a cell and he said, I'm at Petrovka Bridge. It's called Petrovka Bridge. And uh, I said, well, what are you doing at Petrovka Bridge? This guy's sitting here. And, uh, and then he said, that's it. Tell him I don't want nothing to do with him. And then click, he hung up. And then I went through a series of people. People would fly in and I felt bad for a, a guy out of Montreal. He was, uh, he flew here. He waited for him. Um, my dad told him, uh, I was sitting with him. He said, look at, uh, he left again. He said, I'm going to the bank. I'll, I'll be right back. And I shook my head. I said, here we go. And he was looking for excuses to get out. And uh, he, he ended up, I phoned my dad again. He said, tell the guy, I'm going to be, I'm going to meet him at St. Michael's Residential School in Duck Lake, Saskatchewan. And I, I jumped uh, I said, okay, well, you know what? I said, dad, you're going to meet him. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm on my way there. 
So I told him like this guy was French and I said, you, you, you know, where St. Michael's residential school. And he said, yes, yes. Well, is your dad there? I said, yes, he's going to meet you there. That's what he said. And, uh, and he was excited because he thought he was going to go, you know, um, see the site of the residential school and get some real detail about residential school. And he was really, really excited about it. And my, my, uh, so this guy gets ready. I said, okay, he shook his hand. And I, you know, I was, well, as he was walking out, I said, I hope my dad, I hope, I hope you're there for this poor soul. And uh, my dad never met him there. He went home. Guy phones me about uh, three hours later. And, and, you know, where's your father? I said, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. So that's my dad. He, like he, he kept leaving people. And I've been through probably, I would say a dozen situations like that where I would meet him. Um, it would either be an author or, you know, uh, uh, CBC or TSN for us or, or, or American media of some type or books or, or uh, movie scripts. It's always been something and he would, he would, he would uh, run from it. And uh, so I met uh, Penguin Books for me and they were having trouble. They've been trying, they were trying to get through, they were about the 15th person and they were trying to get through to uh to uh, my dad and he wouldn't talk to them he would uh, my mother would say look Neil these people phone and I, I'm starting to feel bad because you feel you feel bad like you just feel really bad and uh, and uh, one of the publishers uh, out of Penguin uh, one of the managers out of there phoned me she's uh, look are you Neil I said yes well, so we want to engage uh, uh, with your dad but I think he's hesitant I said well yeah, that, that, there's got to be a better word than hesitant so uh, and uh, what, what does he want? He said, well, he wants uh, three figure, you know, six figure numbers for us to do his book. And, and I said, yeah, that's, uh, that's a trend. Um, it's just, it's just the way, it, the way he is right now. He, he's going to throw a ridiculous number at you to go away. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't know my dad. So I, I have no idea. My uncle Leo doesn't know him. Um, they were, they were grew up. That's, uh, that would be, uh, our, our relative, uh, Michelle, that's, that's as close as that would be her uncle too. Uh, and, uh, my uncle Peter, he knew because, uh, they went to residential school together. So, um, and, uh, so I, I ended up talking to him, uh, my father and I said, look at like, um, and I'm, I was kind of cruel too. I was, uh, I have to admit, um, I had so much anger. I was trying to get back at my dad. Uh, and what I did is I talked him into doing a book and I talked him into it. And I, the honest truth is I went into the book to hurt my dad. Uh, it's the truth. Uh, I'm the person that, that somewhat put it together, you know, uh, with Penguin and, and Meg Masters, um, the author of the book. Um, I didn't say anything. When our first set of interviews, our, I, had a, I had an agenda in me and, uh, and I wanted to hurt my dad. I, like I wanted him to say sorry to me and to my brothers that weren't around. I really did. I, and the only way I could do it, I thought, was through this book. I wanted a tell-all book, like... So our, my first set of interviews with, with Meg and, and Penguin, um, you know, when we were first doing it, uh, before all the, uh, it, like the, the written, the audio text that we had, um, I, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, you ask him about this, uh, you know, how he hit, how he hit kids, uh, how he hit my brother, you know, because see, these are memories burnt into me, is seeing your dad, uh, uh, coming home drunk and then angry and then watching my mom argue and, and protecting, shielding our, my older brothers. He wasn't mean to me, um, but he, he was hurtful to me. And, but he was, he was really hurt by my older brothers and he took it out on them and he was, he, he hurt them. He hurt them. And, uh, you know, I seen them get whipped. Uh, he would get so mad. My dad was built uh, to hit 100 miles an hour in, in one second. He would go from this 
to hot. And when he got to that point, he, he couldn't turn back. Like, you know, when there's someone that has, they're violent yeah. and they're angry and they can't stop. Yeah. That was my, my dad uh, to us. He couldn't stop. He, he would get angry. And once he got red, once he seen red, that was it. He could not stop. And he would, he would only know how to hurt someone, physically hurt someone. And so, you know, I'm kind of going all over the place because I'm getting a lot of uh, things I want to say. Yeah, for but, sure. But that's the, uh, you know, that that's where we come from. And then something weird happens, something magical in a way. My son is called, is Zane Michael. And Zane Michael is, uh, he's, he's 20 now. Um, but when Zane was 16 years old, um four years ago that would be now um he went and sat beside my dad and he started asking questions about his grandfather uh that's in the book that's who my my dad really missed was uh alexan my my chapan my great grandfather um and and zane um zane bonded with my dad and and zane Zane uh, Zane ended up sitting with him in different places and talking with him and my dad started phoning him and in between time I want to hurt him and then I kind of watched this I witnessed this transformation of, of, uh, of my kid attaching to him and my dad attaching to him my, my son's non-athletic he's a more of a scholar he mm -hmm. likes reading he, he, he loves history. He loves doing, uh, he wants to learn about the past. He, he loves doing family trees. He was doing them at 15 years old. You know, uh, he wanted to know lots about the people that weren't here that, that aren't written down. Like our world's not written down well. We can't document anything from like a hundred years ago. You know, past that's getting really thin for us. Like even that is, is tough to find your ancestry. And uh, so, and, and that's, what, that's what happened there. They, they bonded. He started telling stories. Zane started writing. All of a sudden, Zane started recording. And he started and slowly breaking him down. And then he started asking about uh, residential school to him. And he slowly broke down this old man. And, and it was right, right before the book. It was And then the interview started. And then we went and seen him. I still had my little kick. I wanted to hurt him. And we went, I went and seen him and my mom. And my dad said, what do you think I should do, Neil? I said, I think you should tell your story. But you're going to tell it all. You're going to tell it all. You're not going to hold anything back. Like, you, you have some problems. You have some problems with your kids. And that's part of your story. You, you have to. That's part of what it is. And I don't know anything about what happened to you. I have no idea. What do you want to know, Neil? He said. I said, I, I want to know what happened to you. And I want to know why you quit hockey. And then I want to know why you're so mad. I, I want to know that. Why, why are you so angry? Like, what happened to you? Like, I'm mad. So the more I would talk like that, the madder I would get. Because my, my brother, I, I started losing brothers. The ones that were really affected by him. Like, really deeply affected. They, were, they turned into drug addicts. And they were really handsome looking men. And they turned, they became drug addicts. They became methadone. That was their, their way out. They started uh, injecting needles and uh, a lot of issues. And I know where they came from. Like, I, I know where they, they started from. They started right in front of in our house. And, and so I always had that bitterness towards that. Um, so, and that's, that's kind of how we evolved. When I asked him um, to do it, he said, uh, I'll do it with one condition. I said, okay, what's your condition? And because we're kind of argumentative a bit, but not really, because I'm pushing him. And he's reluctant because once he opens up the, the world uh, to himself, he exposes himself, skeletons come out of the closet. And that's what he was terrified of is what skeletons were going to come out of the closet. Um, 
And he said, I have one condition. I'm going to give my story to Zane. And so he looked at my son and he said, Zane, I'm giving you my story and it's for you. So, and then right there, I, I kind of started settling. Now, Call Me Indian, Call Me Indian really is about an old man that lived through a real hard time and had to live in, 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 in a white world and, and reserve life. And uh, humiliation is, is deep, runs, humiliation runs deep in my dad. And um, um, pain runs really deep inside of him. And he masked out with a bunch of violence and anger because he was a very tough, strong person, physically strong, physically tough and uh, threatening. So, and then he transformed into this, this plot. And this plot is really about this old man um, passing down in our, in our hist in our culture, he's one of the last people, uh, traditional people that, that do this. There's, we still do it, but not to the extent what he was exposed to. And, and so what he, his memory pre-residential school um, is oral tradition, oral history, how we explain life through a story or through my own learning. So old people will tell you their story. And in that story, there's, there's, there's learning. And, and, and when, when they expose their learning to you, you can ask questions. And then because that story is supposed to help you personally, if you're having problem with your family, your spouse, your, 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 yourself, your mental health, the secrets you're hiding, your, your mother, your father, um, any extension of your family, your addiction, oral tradition helps us, um, helps us, and it, it, it tries to attach um, oral stories attached to you. Um, it would be like putting on a shirt, and they stick to you, and, and they tell you, they, they, they stick to you. And they're on your, your, your arms, your, your back, your chest, your legs. They're, they're everywhere. They're in your brain and they're in your heart, but they, they're more on your exterior shell. And you pull one. It's like pulling a card in a library, the old library system. You pull a card and you read it. And that's what oral tradition does for you. It builds you this, this shell of knowledge and information and um, and protection for you and and the only the, the your only obligation to it is to pass it down to someone else that's your only obligation and what my dad did to zane is he passed down oral tradition to him and he did it through call me indian the the story call me indian is about an old man that tells his life story to the only person, not, not the only person, I shouldn't say it like that, but he selected in, in, our, in our community, there could be a, a thousand people, three, 5,000 people, 10,000 people, 20,000 people in a community of people you know were really extended from reserve to reserve to reserve to reserve to tribe to tribe. And your, your extensions run that wide. We're not uh, isolated to our first cousins. It's it's extensions across all over. And out of all those extensions you have, you pick someone. That's the way our world is. You pick one person or you might pick five. And you, you, you pick those people and you find the one that you want to give your, 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 uh, your spirit to. And you want to tell them whatever, whatever it is. And my dad had a powerful story. He had a powerful oral story that he had been, he was looking to pass on. And he tried to pass it on to me years ago. But my shell is hard. And I wouldn't absorb I wouldn't absorb it. My other brothers were were way harder and it wouldn't absorb. It would it would bounce off. 
because everything would be, uh, we wouldn't, it wouldn't, we wouldn't accept it. So we couldn't hang it on ourselves like, like clothes where we could start putting stories on our skin and on our clothes, just like we're wearing it like a jacket. It's the same situation. And he picked out of all the kids he knew and out of all the, the, the adults, the young adults, the mid adults in their 50s, 60s, uh, 30s, all the people that he's seen in, in, his, in his lifetime, he was looking for one person that he would connect to that didn't want nothing from him, didn't want to ask him about hockey. And my, my son wrote a little blurb about uh, a couple lines and my, my father cried because my, uh, my son asked him about Alexson, his grandfather, because everyone before that would ask about hockey. And he, he, he looked at himself as a failure with, with hockey. Like that's my dad looked at his entire life as a fail, as a failure to his own people and to the town, like to the towns around him, to the white people. He, he was close there. We were close to that community. And, and that's where uh, Call Me Indian comes from. It comes from a, a, an oral tradition from an old man trying to, trying to move his memory on before he dies mm. to another young person somehow. And you look for that person and, and you, you find it and it'll attach to you. It just comes to you. And all it was is my kid pulled up a chair and they connected and out of this came all of these stories that no one knew. My mom didn't even know. My mom didn't know that he was raped, you know, in residential school at, at nine years old. My mom never knew. Nothing. My mom, I, I didn't know anything about it. My, uh, you know, I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know when he left residential school uh, to go play in Moose Jaw. It wasn't about playing hockey for him. It was about uh, he had a grade five education when he come out of there. And he had to go into a, 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 like a, a city then, right? 50, 1950s, Moose Jaw is a, a city to us. It's big. It's not like Edmonton, but it's big. It's big from what they're used to in the north. And he had to go there, sit with 16 to 19-year-old boys. They were in grade 11 and 12. And I, I heard him tell him that, talk about that experience where he had grade five education and he belonged in grade five and they were trying to put him in grade 11 or grade 10. And he was five to six grades behind. And, and I'm wondering like, how do you do that? Like a normal person would quit and walk away and just like the humiliation of, of, of not being able to read, like your, your, your learning levels five grades lower to the person you're you're sitting with like I, I couldn't I couldn't I I couldn't understand like how he could sit there but he ended up telling the truth and he, he told I I have grade five grade six I don't even know what my level of reading is he doesn't know my dad was borderline illiterate mm -hmm. um hard work right it's like prairies mm -hmm. is hard work it's cold and hot yeah. Uh, cold winters and and hot and my dad worked with his hands and uh breaking down the relationship with his brothers his sister i didn't know anything about clara my auntie uh i heard about what happened to her um when all the testimonies were coming um you know my uncle leo is very very uh private very private and he read the book and he couldn't believe it. He phoned me and he, he couldn't believe it. He said, no, that's not true, Neil. I said, do you, do you really know your brother? Like I grew in the same house as him. You, you've never seen him. You, do you really, really know your brother? Like I grew up in that house. I didn't even know anything. I didn't know. Did you know your brother was raped? My uncle Peter, who my dad was really close to, um, he, uh, He's part of the story, but, you know, when he came and stayed with me, when the book was came out, he was here for a week and, you know, I, I, I felt sad for him, my uncle Peter, because he went through so much in school 
and and I always wondered why they were looked after their sister and their sister went through horrific things in that school like horrific and it gives you a, a piece of what happened but uh, we told them not to write anything about any of the about Peter and about uh, Clara of what happened to their baby sister other than my dad uh, takes a train and I didn't even know that that he wouldn't leave the school until he pulled a bed up and I remember my auntie Clara saying uh, before she passed away that um, you know uh, your dad came and saved me for a while and I, I didn't understand like it doesn't click in like it doesn't click in because you're just you're, you're you're naive to you're naive it's just it's a different time different era and uh you know um and i i heard her talk about it i didn't know anything about it i phoned my first cousins um who are kim um kim uh, the daughter of clara she's my first cousin um all of her all of her siblings are all addicts um my uncle frank uh, who I really loved. We all loved Uncle Frank. We, we took, I took Leo as a dad. So my Uncle Leo was, was my father. I took him as my father. He just lived a long ways away from me. But I, I, went, to, I went to Leo. And Leo took me as a kid. He picked me up when I was a little boy. Um, but my older brothers ran to different people. And they ran to uncle, my Uncle Frank. And uh, my uncle Frank was tortured in residential school. And there's things in there that my dad wanted to, to say more of, but it was, you know, it just, it was, it was way too much because uh, my dad said, I, I want to, uh, I don't want to hurt my nephews and my nieces. So I phoned, I, I phoned my first cousins, uh, Frank's kids, the ones I could find. And I said, look at, you know, that book's coming out, like brace yourself. Um, you know, there's things about your dad in there, but it's my dad's eyes that are telling you this story. He's, he's what he sees, what he remembers. And he's trying to, the best he can is get it out of him. And um, so brace yourself for it. But, uh, you know, uh, our whole, our whole households were all dysfunctional. Uh, you know, um, you know, I'm not saying, you know, um, but in the seventies, I think rape, um, rape was common with, with girls, yeah. you know, boys going out, uh, girls going out, innocently going out. If they didn't have a brother or a protector, well, they, they, they were raped. And I, you know, and I'm born in 67. So in the middle of the 1970s, you're a nosy kid. You go to the party houses and you, you walk around the houses or you jump in a vehicle, you start getting in a vehicle and you go to a bar and you sit out there and you walk around the old bars. And, but you, you're nosy and you, you're curious and you want to go to those party houses. And I remember seeing people, you know, girls uh, screaming. Uh, and I thought that was normal. I, th I, I, I thought uh, how de demented things are sometimes. Um, I thought those things were were normal, and uh, and and that's what uh, you know. I was trying to get back at my dad for too. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't see anything like that from him, um, but I seen it in a lot of people that were older than me, the generation a bit older than me, and uh, that were born in the fifties, and they uh, were, were really hard on girls. And, you know, uh, innocent girls that were 15, 16, just going out for the first time. And, uh, and that would, would have been their experience. They would have been driven out, um, you know, no one looking after them. They didn't have anyone to watch over them. And, uh, and it happens and it again and again and again. And you see it in, and uh, so it became a normal thing for me. So I think for me personally, I grew up, I grew up, uh, um, just seeing like so much stuff and, and seeing your dad explode. I, I, when the book came, 
I thought, okay, here we go. I'm gonna get back at everyone. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow the lid off this joint, and I'm gonna make my dad fess up to everything he did to my brothers, and I'm gonna make him talk about the toughest things. And I, you know, that's how bitter I was when I got into it, and um, when I, and then when I, when I got through it, I felt so bad. You know, I was so sad that uh, I thought like that 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 I'm just a little kid, just a little hurt kid and a little punk with a mouth. And, uh, you know, uh, real pain is, is uh, you, you can pass it on to people. And I learned that, uh, you know, I learned grief because it talks about my older brothers and my dad. I never, I never seen him cry. You know, I, uh, he must have went places and, and cried like a baby. You know, I never, I never seen him cry. Um, when he died, you know, it, it's so hard. When the, the last edit of his book, uh, the final, final day we were done was November 19th, 2020. It was it. It was, night, it was done. And he goes into the hospital November 20th. And I, I call him on the 19th, the 18th. I think it's around the 18th or 19th. And I call him. I said, Dad, uh, and he was already sick. Like he had COVID, but I didn't, no one knew. He had a fever and he was, but I could, I could kind of sense my mom. So I thought I'd cheer him up. You know, your dad's not feeling good. He's been laying down. So I thought I would cheer him up. And I said, Dad, look at the, it's done. November 19th, like I was happy. I was, I was joyful because I was reading all the manuscripts, I was reading all the, all the, you know, the prep stories and, and, and I changed, I wanted to help him. And, uh, and on the 19th, he didn't want to read it. We were making an audio tape for him. And he said, I'll read it when the book comes out in the 19th. I said, look at, we're done. The thing is going to be out. And when do you, when do you, when will it be out a couple months, dad, maybe like now it's just printing. Uh, maybe in a few months, it'll be out. They were yeah. trying to get it ready for uh, December uh, was their plan was to launch it during Christmas. And then COVID kept delaying it. And on uh, the 20th, uh, he, he, that, that's when he phones me on November 20th. And uh, about 7.30 at night, he phoned me, I think it was. And he couldn't breathe. I, I could hear him talking and he tried to say hello. And it took him three attempts to say hello. And I thought this guy's sick. And two two thirty that afternoon, my uh, the peop the person that caretakes for him was uh, tested positive, and no one knew because he, he didn't say nothing. And uh, and he got tested positive. And then when I talked to him, I said, "Dad, I think I think you might have COVID, and uh, I think you're sick." And uh, he said, "Well, I'm on the way to the hospital." 30 minute drive, he was sitting up. By the time he got to the hospital, he was laying down. And, uh, and the, uh, so that's when I talked to him was when he got to the hospital, he was scared and worried. He said, and my dad's biggest fear, my dad's biggest fear was death. Um, he didn't want to die. Like he, he, was, he was afraid of death, like terrified. He used to have dreams of death, being buried and, uh, and just, fear just like fear of it and my mother would talk him through then she would phone me and said yeah your dad's having these shortness of breath dreams and he thinks he's being buried and I said oh geez eh? and then then he told me about th about three weeks before he died he said uh you know who I seen Neil I said who and he said I seen William Beats and there's this guy that lived uh he would be like a handyman to my grandmother and, and my grandpa, my Muslim and Kokum. His name was William Beats. And he would be family. He would be uh uh the he he was he was he was important to us, William Beats. He was really close to my dad and he was the handyman for my my Kokum and Muslim. And I only remember him living in my grandmother's house. And uh, he was really special to us, really special. And uh, 
and he was really proud of my dad. And, uh, and my dad told me a, a few weeks before, he said, you know, I seen William Beats. I said, okay, like where? He said, I seen him in the kitchen. And uh, I said, when, when did you see him? And uh, I, I, a couple of days ago, no, he, like, wow, how did you see him? I seen him, he turned around and he was standing right in front of me. And I told him, you get away from me, William Beats, or I'm, I'm not gonna come visit you at your grave anymore. And William turned around and walked away. Oh, cool. and, and so you got to understand our culture. Our culture is when you start seeing people um, and they want you to follow. Like, come. Come with me. Come. It's good to see people, but our culture, when it calls you and it calls you like that, you you uh you're not supposed to follow and when he when my dad goes into the hospital on the 20th um on the 24th when he dies i asked him i said okay who are you seeing like is there anyone around you now and he said yeah i said well he said there's people around me he said william beats is looking in the window i said well what's he doing and he said well he's looking I, and, you know, I was talking my dad through death, through a cell phone. And if you ever want to do something really difficult that affects me today, a year later, is talk someone through death on a cell phone. And when everyone around is in masks and downs and, and there's nothing real, is because everything is paper and, and masks and no one can come in there. And you want to feel helpless and hopeful, hopeless, like, and I had to try talk this guy through death when I told him, this is it. They told me this is it now. They're, they're going to give you painkiller, the medication and shallow your breathing, dad. Do you understand? Like, oh, I want to go home. Yeah, I know. But you're not going to, you're not going to go home. I'm feeling better. It's because they're giving you pain medication. That what's what's happening. They're shallowing your 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 breath, so you don't work as hard to breathe. And he was talking really clear, and uh, and then I just told him, you know, when William comes around or your mushroom comes around, and if they put your hand out, you just go. You just follow him. You just follow him. Go. Just go. Don't worry about mom. I we got her here. I got her covered, and just follow. Go. Go follow them. So. Th so my dad never got to read his book and he never got to listen to the audio story. And I asked Wilton Littlechild, I don't know him well, uh, Will, Willie Littlechild, chief, I, I don't know what his right title is. I phoned him and uh, I said, Willie, we're looking for someone to orate the audio book. Uh, he said, I'll do it and I'll do it right now. I loved your dad and I don't know what to do for him because the funeral, no one could come. Like no one could come to the funeral. There's, there's 164 of us in my dad's immediate family, 164 of us alive. And only 30 could come in into the funeral, you know, and, and all of his friends, like all the friends, all his old friends, all these people, they couldn't come in. Peter couldn't come down. Leo couldn't come down. None of them. I put them on a phone about the day before he died. I put P I, I got the nurse to help me figure out how to, you know, with his phone, how to third party um, a call, like add, you know, add, add calls to your phone. I said, I can do it. I I'll phone him. I need him to answer. So you have to be here at this time. And then I had to teach Peter, uh, it was not really good with technology. And then Leo at the same time, I said, Leo, I'm going to phone you at this time. And Peter and your, your brother's leaving. And this is it. And I, you know, it's kind of sad, but I, I witnessed uh, about a 15 minute conversation between three little boys <laughs> and it was really good. But you know, when you, uh, you must be when you're old 
and you get one last chance with your, you know, you're going, you're, you're given a special gift that you know, this is it. And I get to talk to my, my little brothers that I protected. And it was, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a real sad conversation to listen to, but I'm glad I did. So that's, uh, that's, that's us in a nutshell. It's a great story. I think I'm a bit biased. Um, <laughs> there is a, but I've, I've read it a couple of times, but I, there, there's a company out of LA that's trying to buy the rights to it, to turn it into a, a feature film. Um, right now, don't know what we're going to do with it or a Netflix series. I don't know what we're going to do with it. Like, I really don't know. Cause I'm trying to, uh, you go, and another thing I want to teach you. Sure. When, when in our, so when in our, in certain cultures, right. And, and they're different in indigenous, they're, each reserve is different. They're not the same. Like uh, they're all different to each other, but they have common denominators. When someone dies, we're supposed to put all the pictures away for one year, pack everything up, pack it all up, all the stuff, give the clothes away, but all the pictures come down and you put them away. And the problem with me was from the day my dad died uh, till now, I had to look at pictures and that affected my grief because everything was a photo of him, everything. I would turn every every time or answer a phone, and you're supposed to be careful how you talk. I've ha I had to learn through Call Me Indian um, how to remove myself. I had this, I developed this technique, or I would remove myself so I could speak. Like I I could speak about it, and without breaking down. And I developed this technique somehow where I could remove myself in the in the height of of grief, and it, it hit me, uh, it hit me hard, because I I the month before I buried my brother Garth, who's in the book, but he went through tough times, and he was an addict, and I buried him in a in October, and then my dad dies in November, and my and. They had tough deaths. My brother died the year before that, Derek. He's in the book. And he dies a year before that. And it was a it was he was an addict. And he he died from um cirrhosis. He didn't treat his liver. He he took him a year for his liver to die. And it killed him. He wouldn't look after himself. He was an addict. And then my brother Chucky, uh, a couple of years before that, shot a man and then shot himself and Chucky was my father he protected me from my dad and and then and then I watched my mother you know go through all this and then my dad died so I ended up burying him I ended up pulling the trigger on on what to do with his care and give up on it tell him and then bury him wait 10 days because my, my household was infected. There's 22 COVID infections. My mother, my sisters, my siblings, their kids. There was 22 people that got infected at the same time. And it delayed us from having a funeral for 10 days. He's, my dad sat in a morgue for 10 days. And that's, we don't do that. Like we don't do that in our, in our culture. We don't do that. And so we waited. And, and the when we, we brought him out here, he came out on a Saturday morning at 10 and he was buried by one. So my mother got two, two hours with him. That's it, to see him and to realize, okay, this is it. You know, when you see a body, this is it. I'll never see that person again. I'll never talk to them. This is it now. And, and then we all had to leave. It was, we all got in our vehicles and left. Is like nothing happened. Is is the weirdest feeling I can I can't even describe how how that feels when when you go through that and you don't know what's going on. You're still in shock because when you go through a ten day waiting period, 
uh, for your funeral. That's why they're four days for us. They're, they're three, four days. It's because you, you realize the person's gone and then you lay them to rest. We didn't, we had 10 days and by the fifth or sixth day, like what's going on here? Like, you don't know what reality is. And then when you see them, you, you hurt. And then all of a sudden he's, he's, you're bundling them up and then he's gone to the gravesite. And then you have to disperse. You have to leave. We usually have a feast. You, we have to leave. So, and then I stayed away, from, me personally, I stayed away from my mother's house for, it took me eight months to go back to my dad's house. I would make excuses after excuses, all the call me Indian stuff we were going through. I made excuses after excuses. And it took me eight months to walk into my mom's house. And when I did, I cried like a little kid. As soon as I seen the yard, it took me about 15 minutes to get up the steps because it just, it just, grief is so powerful. And, uh, and you're, when you're private too, you're, you're trying to be private about your grief. And at the same time, you have to talk about your dad. And at the same time, you're privately hurting. Like you're, you're sitting somewhere by yourself, uh, you know, uh, just in pain. And my, my uncles are the same. They can't talk about it. They can't talk about it. They can't talk about it. They're, they're still in lots of pain because they haven't, they haven't seen him. They didn't get a chance to see him. It's like this missing person, I think. I, I don't know. But I'm kind of going on and on a little bit too much here. But that's no, you that's, know what? That's what? call me Indian. That's yeah. the story, best I can recall. And uh, there's a lot of twists and turns to it. It's got a lot of. It's, it's a good story. I'm glad we did it. I'm glad my my dad gave my 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 grandkid. Uh, there's this movie. It's called Little Big Man. It always reminds me of that. Where this little big man is a '70s show. My dad used to love it, and uh, it's about this old Indian, this 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 white person talking about uh, he was adopted into a tribe, and he tells about his life to this person writing a book uh, when he's ninety years old, and uh, and that's that's what the story always reminds me of. So I, you know, you try find happiness or it, uh, the whole thing, the whole thing really set me back. Uh, it really did where it, it's a, it affected my work personally. I'm responsible for his estate. You know, when you start cleaning up estates uh, for him, because, you know, I have one older brother than me, you know, he's not healthy. He's got, he's, a, a, you know, I, I watching him cry because, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of pain in my siblings and uh, they could never tell their dad. My dad, when he died, I'm gonna tell you how much residential school affects someone. Uh, this is the only way I can explain it. His last words to me, I said, you know what, dad? You know what, I love you. I never said those words in, in my entire life to him at what, 54, wow. 53, 54. Yeah. I've never said that ever, ever in my life to him. No one has. And I told him that, and there was a pause, and he couldn't spit it out back. And, and that's the truth. And when people say, how, how does residential school, how does, how does someone that went through residential school that got deeply affected, uh, how, do you, how, do you, what, how do you explain a response? It's my only response where someone can recognize that you go out on a limb and you tell someone, I love you, because you've been waiting since uh, all your life to say that. You hear it all the time, and you, you go out on a limb, and the person can't spit those words back to you. That's what residential school does to mm -hmm. people. Some people, other people, they, they, they love their kids extra because of what happened to them. In this case, my dad held it in right to the end. He still was very protective of uh, his state, you know, his, his, his inside. He couldn't, 
couldn't go around and tell everyone I love you. So that's call me Indian. I don't know if I helped you guys or no, you did a million times, Neil. I can't thank you enough for sharing all that. I uh you know, obviously it's an incredible story to share and I I honor you for giving that emotional side of yourself and telling us these last minutes. I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate it. Um, and, and then hearing, of course, you know, that side of my family that I, I, I didn't get to see that. I just know Auntie told me that, um, you know, we thought if there was someone who was going to make it, it was going to be him because he was chopping wood the day before he went in, you know, just the assumption he was one of the healthiest people that could make it if he was gonna. So, you know, from my point of view, hearing all of that is incredibly uh, important. And I, I'm looking forward to telling my family. Um, in this book club, what we do is we actually allow Indigenous people the opportunity to speak first, because settlers have always taken that spot. And um, so I, I see your hand has been up for a long time, Rosemary, oh, but I, I definitely... No, no, no I ha it's not up. Oh, it is up, but that's okay. So oh, I would I, want it, to... It's a technology thing. I didn't put it up, sorry. Okay, can I um, encourage others? I'm just gonna mute you then, um, Rosemary, and um, ask uh, uh, Indigenous, if there's anyone Indigenous here that would like to ask Neil or, or tell Neil about uh, something about the book that really you wanna share. Okay, Kathy, just unmute yourself. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I just found reading the book. I started to get a little bit angry because I'm like, this seems so much like another book. And, and just having that confirmed at the end there, it just kind of made me sad because there is so much lateral violence. This whole book made me think about lateral violence and and how it comes out and and how the kids were mean to the younger kids because of it all and and yeah, I just uh, I just found it really hard. It, it made me really sad to think of all that pain and those little kids taking it out on other little kids and and. Um, and even good people like Richard Wagamese, to me, that was kind of for him to not acknowledge at all that uh, I just found it very, I was saddened by that. Um, and thank you so much, Neil, for, for sharing your story. It's um, all too familiar. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that's good, thank you. Uh, Neil, I wanted to tell you, um, when Calgary had their Olympic bid, that was the first time I had really went into the sports calls to action and to keep reading Fred um, speaking in the, in the TRC books and then in the CBC, um, that was what really hit me. And I would always tell people that, no, my uncle is a real life uh, Indian horse, a real life. And I yeah. think people have always brushed me off and they never really understood the gravity of what I was talking about. And I said, like, if you read the TRC and, you know, I was doing a podcast on the sports calls to action, but I could just tell it was going over the heads of settlers. And I just need you to know how much it impacted me. Um, I think I was mourning for over a month, uh, the childhood that he never had. Um, and then the uh, hockey career that, while he made the NHL, you know, I grew up in Sylvan Lake and that's a real settler hockey uh, town. So I know how important hockey is when it's the only thing there is. And, you know, I remember telling my dad, I want to play hockey. And he said, no, girls don't do that. So I wasn't allowed, um, you know, and, and again, this is way back in the early eighties and, and back when it was perfectly acceptable for a dad to basically punch your kid out in front of the public and everybody was cool with it, right? So these were things I wouldn't fight. And um, I don't know if you know, but my mom and dad, my first memories of life are them fist fighting. And um, so, so like that, you know, history of family violence, like that absolutely penetrated my life. And that's part of the reason why I 
I'm so passionate about the topic of violence against women, violence against Indigenous women and the missing and murdered, because it, it just, I, my mom survived, but I can tell she's not the same. And I knew she grew up in domestic violence and she's not who she could, who, who she could be because of, um, you know, some people call it being punched drunk or, you know, but ultimately multiple head injuries, right? And I, I just really struggle with that because I don't think people from families that don't come from violence, they have no concept of what we're talking about. So when I read what happened to your, um, to your dad just through the media, just through the TRC, it really affected me because I knew, I knew that was why that was part of my my legacy too. Um, my family went through uh, Fort Providence, the uh, Sacred Heart there. That would have been my great grandparents and my my granny, and then uh, two of my my aunt and an uncle went to a different one, an Anglican one, I guess. So. And like, I really started to understand the gravity of how it was all affecting us. And I always felt awful that he couldn't, um, you know, be who he needed to be as a sports player. And of course I had no background of what he was like as an actual father. So all of that, I, I really appreciate you sharing. Um, I'm not seeing any other indigenous hands up. Is there anybody else who would like to tell Neil uh, the impact of the book on them or a question that they might have? I, if I could, I think like Indian Horse is tough. I haven't watched it yet. My my dad got a uh, I got a call from my dad in Toronto. He was at the Museum of Man or Museum. What is it? Civilization in Gatineau. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, he, he phoned me a couple of days before, and he said, I'm I'm flying out to Toronto, and uh, I'm gonna go go to a Toronto Maple Leaf game, I think, and. I'm going to uh, there. I'm going to some opening. I said, oh, okay. Uh, he phoned me um, that evening, and he said, "You know where?" Uh, and I was helping him then, like I was trying to help him. And um, he said, "I'm at this movie premiere called Indian Horse," and you know, uh, they introduced me as Indian Horse. And what is that? And I said, you know what, Dad, I don't even know what that is. It's a movie. There's a book. He said, and they're taking photos of me with the movie posters. And there is a cutout of the actual hockey player uh, that was portraying Indian Horse. And, uh, and so he left. And then they wanted to fly him over to New York for the American uh, premiere of Indian Horse. And then the actor got into some trouble uh some his, history come around and stung the launch or something happened with with the actor i don't know what happened to him but he got into some publicity and um then my dad said yeah, i i think it's about that guy in kamloops i said what guy there is a guy that lived beside peter's uncle peter and his uh he was a wagamese and uh he was writing this story about this uh, residential school. And he asked me if he could write a, a story, a novel about me. And I said, no, no, I don't. Cause I just gave you the, the skinny of how my dad was, how evasive it was. And this is going back years before this. And, uh, and uh, I think my auntie was very close with Richard, my auntie Muriel, they were very close. And what my uncle Peter told me is that, uh, this guy would come over about, you know, for a few years and he would have coffee and he, he would start talking about, cause he couldn't get through to my dad, but he would start, he was picking away at uh, Peter's memory uh, about residential school and hockey. Like he was a residential, like he went through lots, Richard, I think what I read about it. And it got me really angry when Penguin books, you know, when the people in Penguin found out when they did the research about Indian horse, they were really, really, uh, um, you know, I got angry because they wanted to autocorrect what happened to Indian horse, the story, the book, uh, in their view, it's, it's, uh, it's unethical. Like it, it, there, there's a professionalism in, in our world. They explained to me and uh, there should have been a credit given because why would they fly your dad 
and make him Indian horse and they have the real one. And you know, you got to remember my dad was like 84, 83 and he was walking around and didn't have a clue what was going on and taking pictures. He had no idea what he was doing there. And then he said, I guess I'm going to New York. These guys want me to go to New York for some movie that's happening. And do you know anything about it? I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. But that's that's what happened with that. And I'm, I'm glad, I think they toned it down the actual what happened with Indian horse and and uh, but I was angry about it but it's it's a uh, at least it's out now you know uh, you know about what Indian horse it was big success but it's based on it's based off of Francis Akamus yeah and I wish they would say that like I wish they would just say that I don't know anything about who developed that thing but I wish they would just say that like inspired by or based on or a connection to it because that's what it was sure. and uh and just you know but you know how things are people maybe they're worried about money and, and admitting you know I, we don't care i don't care about money so you know none of our family does so we're not looking for it either so but anyway i'm kind of rambling hey thanks so we have another hand up go ahead Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I have problems with unmuting sometimes. Um, the first thing I want to say is how much I appreciate Neil um, joining us on this on this call. I I haven't been around my family for quite a bit, and it made me realize how much I miss um, the tradition of storytelling. So I can't tell you how um, grateful I am to have that time. To just listen. Um, I could listen to you forever. Um, and really, I wanted to express so much appreciation for your father's book um, and for this story because I read it in a um, fever almost this weekend. And it was such a relief and a comfort to see. Um, my own struggle with trying to reconcile identity that colonization has projected on me and the indigenous heritage I was born with and that I sadly don't have as much connection with me and it just made me feel so much less alone. So I am truly so grateful for this book and, and I, I hope you um, never forget how important your fathers and each of our stories are. And truly, I'm just so thankful for this book. Amen. Well, thank you very much. It means a lot, you know. I, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn. It's, I'm trying to learn and. Uh, but I witnessed something special that I, I probably won't, but it makes me want to do it. I witnessed uh, um, how our people pass down their stories and, and, and I had a ton of teachings in there and like a ton of teachings. And, um, you know, I, I, it's, how our, it's how our life uh, existed before, you know, it all changed for us. And, you know, I'm trying to get used to the scepter concept. I, I don't have that in me yet. I, I don't know. Uh, my dad taught us, uh, one thing he taught us was uh, be re being really respectful, like try not to separate colors uh, of people, like try try not. So, you know, and I get it. I, I, I just, I, I'm trying to learn it. And, and you got to take it for a grain of salt here, what I say, like, um, I'm trying to learn how to not offend anyone, I, but I never did because my dad never believed my grandparents, my dad, they never believed in white, brown, black. They never believed in colors at, at all. There's nothing with race, no matter what, uh, there was never race. So it's hard for me to categorize people it really is a, it's a real struggle for me 
and I'm trying my real best because it seems to be the thing to do. Uh, and I, you know, you got to be patient with how I say I don't explain very well, but I'm really struggling with categorizing people really bad. And I'm 54. And, uh, and I know who I am, but I know the, Ukra the Ukrainian, the German person, I know they have culture. And, and, and I know there's, there's a whole segment lost in their, they don't have a culture anymore. And it's there. They just don't know what it is. And it's, they just don't know what their culture is. But there's a celebration of culture. Uh, it's there. I just don't know what it is. So I had a little kick there going on. And I would say, what do you call yourselves? Like, like make it easy on me. I call you non-First Nation. Because I have no idea what to call you. I'm sorry, but I have no, and I don't want to call you a bad name, a colonizer. Like, I, I don't understand that word yet. Be, because sometimes the word is hurtful. And my dad, so when he, when he, when we, they named the name, it came from a non-First Nation person that made the name Call Me Indian. It was from a publisher. Now, I got a real knee-jerk reaction to it. They wanted to call the book Call Me Indian. And I told my dad, and we went and seen, we talked to him. We had a meeting with my siblings, my mom. I said, okay, the book, we need a title. We came up with all these indigenous names because you're trying to identify uh, only yourself. You don't want to hurt anyone else. And uh, when the penguin came and said, we want to call it Call Me Indian. I said, that's such a hard word. I'm okay with it. But it's such a hard word, and uh, and uh, and my dad, his only response to it was, "I just don't want to hurt people with that word. I'm okay with it. I identify with the word, but I'm old. That's a long time ago. But I still call myself Indian. Um, it's only an English reference to how you ice ice break with with someone else that's not your your nation. You know." Uh, that's all it is it's an icebreaker and and you know and i'm probably going way past the line here no not at all but but that's what it is so when someone calls themselves a, a colonizer i'm really struggle with that to be honest like personally i, I do like like i really do I'm, I'm i'm trying to learn this new concept but i i don't i like personally I don't need reinforcement. Uh, like I don't need reinforcement to like to know who I am. Just like you don't. You came from a country. You had a culture. Uh, you just lost it. It got mixed, like soup, and you lost your culture. And Canadians are trying to find a culture. Americans have a culture now. They've developed their own, but they squeezed everything out of everyone that that came before that. Canadians are are trying to define what their culture is it's not oil and gas or you know mining or forestry or or uh, farming those are those are fabrics that make your your life in your in your own story you have a culture there's a language there's a tradition um, you know there's a land base but your land base you, you should always be connected to your land base because I have friends that are, I have a lot of friends, but I try and understand their culture. I, I've learned the Mennonite culture a bit because I have a friend that's Mennonite. And I'm curious. I want to understand what Mennonites, where did you come from? You were persecuted. Okay, from where? Now, what's your language? Okay, it's German. And then how do you believe? Okay, you believe like this, you know. But I, I no different than you. I know you. I know you as a, well, my dad would say a white person better than I know, I mean, uh, ourselves. As strange as it may sound, but I know you really good. But I know you good enough to know that you can't define who you are. I know that. You struggle with that because you, you get pushed from here to there, I think, or you're pushing yourself to spots you don't like. So... And, uh, but I, I know you good. 
but I don't know us good yet. I'm learning us. And if, if, if I have to call you a colonizer, well, I, the honest truth, I would never say that word. I would, I would never call you a colonizer. It's the, the truth. I would never use that word because our culture is really based on, on really deep rooted principles. And one of them is, is not to hurt people. And whatever comes out of my mouth, I don't hurt people with it. I'm not supposed to. Whatever I hear, I define what's right and wrong for me. I define that. But we're identifying with our, our own selves right now. We lost a whole generation and we're picking it up slowly, a lot stronger, more on our feet. Um, uh, and I see Canadians struggling with it because they don't know what to do with it now. And you'll, you'll read this book, you'll get influenced, call me Indian, you know, all this stuff. And you're getting an understanding of, of them, of those people now. You're getting an understanding and I'm really glad and I'm really glad you're open-minded, but I can't hurt you because my, my tradition and my belief system says I can't. That's why there's treaties because they grabbed you and they brought you. Nothing's changed. They, they, they took you and they embraced you and they said, come here. Because someone told them you were hurt over there. They had to leave uh, where they lived. They left. They came here for a reason. They were poor or they were starving or someone was killing their family. There's a reason. And our, our people grabbed you and they brought you. They brought you like that. And it's the same principle exists today. We can't. Like, I can't say for everyone. Everyone's built differently. I can only give you one philosophy from, or one theory from a person that has, <laughs> that doesn't know much. But my, my own teachings from the people and I love that are around me taught me. They taught me not to hurt anyone on the earth. Anyone. I can't hurt anyone. I can't hurt, I can't hurt you with my mouth. If I go overboard and insult you, I have to say sorry to you. No matter what you do to me, I still have to say sorry. Like, it's the way we're built, you know? So, like, I'm way over the line here of what, what I'm supposed no. to be here for. But it's, no. it's a new concept for, for people like me uh, trying to figure it all out. You know, I don't, I guess some people want to right the wrongs. I don't know. I'm okay. I'm, I know who I am. I'm on my feet. I know what my kids are. They're a lot stronger than me than I was. And, uh, you know, if they want to run the world, run the world. You know, if they want to build big buildings, go ahead. Like, like no, you can't, nothing's going to stop them. It's just how we interact with each other. Because uh, the opposite could happen. It, there could be a real nasty split between white and, and indigenous people. And it could be just split down the line, just a different highway. Yeah. But uh, same Neil? We are at our limit. We're at okay. eight, eight o'clock and I can't thank you enough for being here. And I, I just, I, I'll send you the link right away once I have it uploaded so that people can listen to what you said today. And I just can't thank you enough for honoring us here at, in, in Calgary to come join us and tell us all about your dad and, and sharing so much. I feel so grateful as, um, you know, a distant niece to to hear my family talk about this so thank you from the bottom of my heart okay everyone keep safe thanks for your time thanks everybody for coming thank you thank you Oh, look at all these comments. They're great. Oh, it's great. All right. Well, thanks a million, Katie, for everything. And I will st hit stop. <laughs>